Binding vows, binding vows, binding vows, binding vows. At this point in JJK, why learn anything? Why learn a new curse technique? Why try and get more cursed energy? Why try to get better with your curse energy manipulation? Just use a couple of well-placed binding vows and you'll be a world eater. Oh no, do you have the least control over your vessel you've ever had? Has the entire manga hinted at you not being able to use a domain expansion, let alone a full power domain expansion? Let me introduce to you Binding Vows. Oh no, are you still in that incredibly weakened vessel because you just got hit by eight black flashes, but now you want to use your ultimate technique that you didn't even use against Gojo because you couldn't find a situation to pull it off? And now you're in a substantially worse situation, but you still want to use that ultimate technique? Have you heard of Binding Vows? Because here's the beauty of Binding Vows. They undo everything we've ever been told. Should you be weak right now? Yeah. Should you be able to pull off a domain expansion right now? No. Should you have the speed and power of a Fuga that you used against Jogo in perfect shape? No. But have you heard of binding vows? Oh, I should have known. I should have known. Like, oh, Yuji just hit eight black flashes in a row. Things are looking good for the good guys that Gege was going to get back together with Sukuna and put him into as many plot device situations as possible. And while the binding vows applied to the domain expansion to allow it to open for 90 seconds kind of made sense. My God. God, is it so much worse this week. What's terrible about the fact that we're just using Binding Vows as a plot device to circumvent everything that's happened up until this point in the manga is that everything else about this chapter was awesome. We had a meaningful sacrifice from an important character, a touching goodbye from two beloved characters, the return of a character everybody thought was gone, and the reveal that I was right about who the second Switch was with, and that I was right about how Yuji learned blood manipulation. And thank god I made a TikTok about it before I made a YouTube video about it, because we still haven't edited the YouTube video together, but it's already been proven correct, and now it's just sitting in limbo. That's why I gotta make the TikTok sometimes to throw a marker at the board to let everybody know that you are ahead of the curveball. But enough about all that. The leaks for chapter 259 of JJK are now out, which means it's time for you and me to sit down and have our weekly or bi-weekly trauma fest. Because JJK wants to remind us, just like with life, even if things look like they're going well, don't worry, you'll get kicked in the shins eventually. And in this week, we got not only a little bit of the shin kicking treatment, but also a little bit of the silver lining because chapter 259 was centered around the concept of brotherhood, both in the highs and in the lows, where we had to say a touching goodbye to one of Yuji's brothers, but a surprising hello to another. So today we gotta take the good with the bad because this week we're talking chapter 259 of JJK Explained. But before we get to explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And, and if you guys love the idea of me breaking down your anime and manga, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, Otaku's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime and manga this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And if you want to see me live, come on down to Houston for Memorial Day weekend, May 24th to the 26th, to see me at Comic Palooza, where I'm going to be doing six panels talking about being an anime YouTuber, my anime podcast, and talk about Hunter Hunter and Naruto. See, as I've already established, Chapter 259 was a massive chapter for JJK. But not because a lot happened in the modern day. I mean, like, yes, a lot does happen, but in a very short course of time. No, a lot happened in chapter 259 because in chapter 259, we got two separate flashbacks that helped explain to us a lot of what happened in the time skip between Gojo's unsealing and the beginning of the Sukuna battle. That revealed to us the second person that Yuji switched with, how Yuji learned blood manipulation, and how Toto might return to the battlefield at full capacity. So on all, the chapter was heavily focused on both Toto and Chozo, Yuji's brothers. And if that sounds like an incredible chapter to you, well, it was, at times. Let's get into it. Chapter opens with our first of two flashbacks. And in this flashback, Yuji is talking to Chozo and Naruto Shikamo, the new one. And the chapter opens with Yuji asking Chozo to teach him convergence. But Chozo is struggling to try and figure out how to teach Yuji convergence because he's not a good teacher, which we already knew because about 15 chapters ago, when I theorized that Yuji was going to learn blood manipulation, he thanked Noritoshi and said that Chozo wasn't a good teacher. So this chapter is supposed to fill out the context of that moment. But while Chozo was struggling to try and figure out how to teach Yuji convergence, Kamo takes over and clearly explains to Yuji exactly how blood manipulation and convergence works. Now Chozo, who's possibly feeling the fact that his chance to help his brother was slipping through his fingers, told Yuji that he could teach him how to use the supernova attack that Chozo uses. The big ball of blood that Chozo remotely detonates to shoot shotgun blasts of blood in all directions. But Kamo says this isn't a good idea, and instead Yuji should focus on using blood manipulation to stop his bleeding and to suture his wounds.
blue, which is more or less exactly how we've seen Yuji use blood manipulation up until this point. As Yuji literally in the last chapter had his leg cut off, but was able to reattach it using blood manipulation and reverse curse technique. On top of that, through the halftime talk he had with Chozo about Chozo telling him to breathe his blood into all corners of his body, Yuji has pretty much mastered reverse curse technique through the usage of blood manipulation. To this point that the leaks say at least that Yuji reveals that the second person that he switched with was Yuta, but I don't know how or what the context is. And what's worse than that is that all of the direct translations don't seem to say anything about Yuta. And listen, by the time that this video comes out, we'll probably have better context on what Yuji was saying here and how it's revealed that Yuta was his second switch. But basically, somewhere in the conversation that Yuji has with Chozo and Noritoshi, he reveals that the second person he switched with was Yuta, which would make sense for all of the reasons that I formulated, being that Yuji now knows how to copy people's techniques based off what he's consumed, and that he learned reverse curse technique, but the way that he learned reverse curse technique was through blood manipulation. On top of that, Yuta wouldn't be the best person to teach Yuji RCT because he does RCT by instinct. So this moment has me kind of confused, but apparently the second person that Yuji switched with was Yuta. Now, I guess fortunately, or possibly unfortunately for us, this flashback is only one page long, and on the next page is a two-page spread of Sukuna, charging up his fire arrow, which we now know is named Kamino. And on this double spread page, Gegekatami is getting his PhD in Japanese, as he explains to the power of pen no jutsu, that Sukuna is gonna be able to use Kamino on everything in his current domain expansion range, because of a binding vow. Now, basically what Gege says in this long-winded explanation of why Sukuna is going to be more powerful than he should be is that after going through the cooking processes of cleave and dismantle, the door to Kamino, or Fuga, the fire arrow, will open. And that Kamino, this fire arrow, is Sukuna's actual ultimate technique. Basically, what Gege is telling us in this moment that Kamino, while incredibly powerful, is slow and doesn't have a wide effect range. That is to say, it's an arrow. And thus, if you get hit with this arrow, like Jogo, you're doomed to die a fiery death. And while this wouldn't necessarily be an issue if there was only one person this arrow was being launched at, there are currently four people inside of Sukuna's domain. Maki, Ino, Chozo, and Yuji. And thus, if Sukuna wants to hit all four of these people in his domain with Kamino, he would have to increase its range and its speed so nobody could outrun it, all without losing firepower. So, how does he do this, you ask? Take a guess. A binding vow. But what was that binding vow that allowed him to make his slow and narrow fire arrow into an all-encompassing, complete domain expansion, exploding fire arrow? Was it something difficult? Did it result in Sukuna's death? Did he have to be hit with the fire himself? Nope. So far as I can understand, all Sukuna had to do was change the innate technique of his domain to that of Kamino, and close off the border of his domain to the exit and entry of any beings, while shrinking his domain down to the effective range of Kamino. In essence, all Sukuna had to do in order to make his personal fire arrow into a everybody fire arrow was make his domain expansion operate like a regular domain expansion that is to say not letting people in or out and possibly shrink its effective range by a couple of meters oh we're going crazy with it gege because of course that seems like just enough that one would need in order to turn their personal pan pizza into the world's biggest pie like is that even a binding vow Oh, what do you mean? Cleave and Dismantled now aren't applied to his domain expansion, and instead it's Kamino. That could be considered a downgrade. How? Oh, but also the fact that you're able to freely enter and exit Sukuna's domain is one of the strongest parts of his domain because it allows him to increase its range. Hey, uh, the range is still massive, and everybody he needed in there was already in there. Now, I... It could be wrong here because I'm reading a direct AI translation, but from what I can suss out, that is the binding vow he made. Which sucks. Like it's just, it's just a plot device. And in like the most important part of the story, we're just getting so lazy with our writing. Like every time Sukuna is placed in a corner, he just binding vows his way out of it. And it just chops down the legitimacy of this entire power system at the ankles. Because sure, you can go with the angle that Sukuna understands binding vows better than anyone, and therefore he should be able to apply them at the highest level, something that no other sorcerer could ever accomplish. It's just so thin. Whatever. Let's move on to the third page. After Binding Val Kaisen has been explained to all of us, the unadoring masses, we cut to Arame and Hakari, who are for some reason still fighting, and both seem kind of fine. And Arame says to Hakari, it's our win. 
After which the narrator reveals to us that Kamino applies such incredible heat that it actually results in overpressurization within Sukuna's domain expansion. And thus everything inside of Sukuna's domain expansion dies immediately. The narrator then goes on to say that this is Ryu Minsukuna's ultimate technique, the technique that killed Maharaka in one strike. Kind of disrespectful, he didn't put Jogo in there as well, but okay, yeah, sure, killed Maharaka. The narrator then goes on to say that during Sukuna's battle against Gojo, he constantly had to change the specifics of his domain, which usually resulted in Sukuna narrowing the effective range of his domain. As I don't know how many of you can remember this, but the maximum range of Sukuna's domain expansion is 200 meters. But often in his battle against Gojo, as both of them were trying to break each other's domains from the outsides, Sukuna was either trying to augment the range of his domain to be just beyond that of Gojo's, or it would end up being within Gojo's. Regardless, the takeaway here is that during his battle against Gojo, he was never able to hit his true 200 meter range. And because Sukuna was already augmenting the range of his domain expansion, he figured that using Kamino just wasn't worth it in a battle against Gojo. So in his battle against Gojo, he sealed the technique. Meanwhile, in the backdrop of the narrator telling us all of this, we see a massive 200 meter in diameter spire of fire lifting from the Tokyo skyline, which is assumed to be exactly where Sukuna's domain expansion was. And thus it's safe to assume that everybody who was caught in Sukuna's domain expansion is caught in that fire. And for at least two of the people that were caught in that domain expansion, that's safe to assume. Because just before the flames are able to get to Yuji, Chozo flies to his side and surrounds Yuji in blood. A blood domain expansion, if you shall. Well, closer to a blood simple domain, but still. And as Chozo builds this simple domain of blood around Yuji, he apologizes to him for being useless in their training. And while he's making this apology to Yuji, he's being burned away by the flames of Kamino. But Yuji is perplexed by what's going on. He's surrounded by blood and he hears Chozo's voice. Then thus he places his hands on the walls of this simple domain and looks for Chozo, screaming, Chozo, no, why? To which Chozo responds by saying, I'm sorry I was useless during your training. I'm the kind that does it by instinct. And it's at this point that we see Chozo and Yuji sitting at a table in a lush forest. The same table that Chozo had seen Yuji, Esso, and Chechisu eating at together when he first came into contact with Yuji's aura. And thus that is to say that Chozo and Yuji are in their imaginary soul world together. Chozo then compliments Yuji for learning RCT faster than him. To which Yuji responds by saying he was only able to figure it out faster because Sukuna used it while he was in his body. But Chozo says he doesn't need to be humble because little brothers are supposed to surpass big brothers. But it's at this point that Yuji begins to understand what's going on and begins to scold Chozo, saying he can't just disappear. To which Chozo responds by saying, you're right. I need to apologize to Tsukumo too. Now, for those of you who don't remember who Tsukumo is, Tsukumo is Yuki, the third special grade sorcerer, the one who taught Toto. She died in the battle against Kenjaku, saving Chozo's life, which is why he feels as though he needs to apologize to her. Because while she was giving her last ditch attempt to try and kill Kenjaku, she told Chozo to live on as a human. Chozo then apologized to Yuji and says he's leaving him alone once again. But Yuji says it's okay because you are always at my side when times were toughest. And that's enough. To which Chozo responds with simply, right. It's at this point that we get a flashback to Ezo, Kechisu, and Chozo when they were still death womb paintings. And Ezo asks Chozo, big brother, are you there? To which Chozo responds by saying, I'm right here. It's at this point that Kechisu says, brother, I'm cold. To which Chozo responds by saying, it's all right, let's talk. If we all talk together, we'll forget about the cold. And Chozo then thinks about how the last 150 years that Esso, Kechisu, and Chozo all experienced was just a couple of days for Yuji. That is to say that Yuji went through all the pain and suffering that the three of them went through in a significantly shorter timeline. On top of that, the brotherhood that the three of them had for a century and a half, Yuji only had for a matter of months. We then cut back to reality where Yuji is telling Chozo, Thank you for being my brother. After which it pans out to the devastated landscape of everything that existed in the domain expansion. And the only thing still standing within that domain is a bubble of now blackened blood. And that bubble begins to fade away. And as it does, we see Yuji say, thank you, Anaki, which means thank you, big brother. Which is the first time that Yuji ever calls Chozo big brother. He had called him brother, but never big brother. And as the rest of the blood bubble begins to dissipate around Yuji, he stands up and looks around and says, guys, someone, and realizes he's completely alone. His biggest fear has come true. In this battle against Sukuna, every person who has stood against him besides himself has perished. It's exactly what Gege Akatami has always wanted for Yuji. True loneliness, true solitude, 
true fear and loss of resolve. At this point, the narrator chimes in by saying that Yuji had convinced himself he was a cog. No matter what happened, he was meant to fulfill his role. But as he looked around him and felt the heat of the scorched earth raising off the ground, the very core of his resolve had been shaken. That resolve being the debt he now felt as though he owed Chozo for giving his life to protect him. But this isn't the first time that Yuji had lost his resolve. In fact, this is a fairly similar situation to exactly what happened to Yuji in his battle against Mahito. See, at the end of the Shibuya incident, when Yuji was scarred by how many people he had lost to the literal hands of Mahito, those being the likes of Nobura and Nanami, his resolve began to crumble, and he began to give in to the depression that Mahito wanted him to give in to. And this situation is no different. But how Yuji gets out of this situation is also no different. Because as Yuji begins to give up on everything as Sukuna slowly begins to approach him out of the smoke and fire, once again appearing by Yuji's side in his lowest moment is his other brother, Toto. Toto, who's wearing a massive bandage over the hand he lost in the battle against Mahito. Now this is curious because obviously when Toto claps his stump to his hand in the battle against Mahito at the very end of it, he not only doesn't switch places with either Mahito or Gyuji or any inanimate object, but also proclaims that his boogie woogie is already dead. But the bandage that Toto is wearing on the arm that lost his hand makes it seem a whole lot like there's a hand under that bandage. As the bandage is shaped like a paddle, or I guess, like a hand. But if Toto still just had a stump on that arm, it would just kind of be a stump wrapping. And thus, it's somewhat safe to assume that after the events of the Shibuya incident, that Toto got his hand back somehow, or got a hand back. And that's not unrealistic to assume. I mean, regrowing limbs and internal organs is absolutely something you can do with reverse curse technique. In fact, we saw Gojo in the battle against Sukuna and Maharaga regrow an entire arm. And it's been implied throughout the duration of the battle against Sukuna that if he ever regains his reverse curse technique, he'll regrow his other hands. Now, Toto, so far as we know, can't use reverse curse technique. Thus, somebody else would have to apply the reverse curse technique to his stump to regrow his hand, which could possibly explain why his hand is still in a bandage. Because as we know, reverse curse technique when applied to somebody else is less effective. And thus, while there might be a hand back, it may not be a super functional hand. And speaking of non-super functional hands, we then cut to Sukuna, who's now standing across from Toto and Yuji. We then head to our second flashback in this chapter, where Toto and Meimei are planning on possible ways to save people from Sukuna's domain. And the plan that they come up with is that by using Meimei's crows in Toto's boogie woogie, that Toto could possibly use his boogie woogie to switch the places of sorcerers inside of Sukuna's domain with crows outside of Sukuna's domain and then just send the crows to their death in Sukuna's domain. Because remember, Toto doesn't have to be the person doing the place switching. He's able to switch the places of other people and things he can see. And thus, if Toto was able to look into Sukuna's domain and see Maki or Ino or Chozo or Yuji, he could clap his hands and switch the location with a crow that's outside of Sukuna's domain. And since the technical fatal flaw to Sukuna's domain is that you can leave and enter, this would pull people out of the domain, possibly fast enough to save their lives. The obvious issue is, is that Sukuna's domain pretty much kills people instantaneously. So as fast as it's activated, Toto needs to be able to clap those people out of the domain. So there's no guarantee that he's able to save anybody inside of Sukuna's domain. And on top of this, Meimei says, since Toto is going to be outside of Sukuna's domain range, that he's going to have to increase the effective range of his curse technique by a lot. And she asks if he'll be able to do that with those hands. To which Toto says he's not not entirely sure, but he can still feel the heartbeat of Boogie Woogie inside of him, meaning he's still got Boogie Woogie. But Toto says to Meimei that they can't let Yuji know that this is their plan, because Yuji and Sukuna were at one point two souls in one body, and while that's in the past, if Toto were to tell Yuji this plan, there's a possibility the plan would inadvertently leak out to Sukuna, which is a mangaka cover-up. People have been yelling at Gege for literal months ever since he decided to write Toto, a fan-favorite character, out of the manga entirely, and I am 93% certain that Gege realized he had to rewrite Toto back into the story. Like, I fully, fully believe that Gege had every intention of having the Shibuya incident be Toto's last big event in the entirety of JJK, but that he got so much hate and vitriol from the JJK fandom that he realized he had to bring him back in some capacity. Because losing a hand in the JJK universe is not a big deal. So them being like, oh, we couldn't tell Yuji is just Gege's way of saying, oh, this is why you didn't hear about this until this moment. It has never once even been 
hinted at that Tsukuna has any ability whatsoever to tap into Yuji's memories currently. This is the second biggest ass pull in this entire chapter. And listen, I'm not complaining. I'm happy Toto is back in the story. And yeah, Gekyo's obviously gonna have to explain that, oh yeah, Toto's back and this is why, and this is why you haven't heard anything about it. But I just want you as fans to know if you've ever screamed at the clouds about Toto being written out of the story, even though he's an incredible character and the way that he was written out of the story was stupid, that you're probably responsible for his return. The narrator then goes on to say that Toto was under sure of his allies' safety and wasn't able to get the Yuji or Chozo because they were at the center of Tsukuna's domain. That is to say that Toto's effective Boogie Woogie range wasn't able to reach them from outside of the domain. But Toto doesn't have the time to explain all of this to Yuji, so he tries to console him by screaming, I'm sorry, brother, but the other sorcerers are probably all right. Which means that Ino and Maki probably made it out of the domain with the help of Toto. But they might have been lightly scorched before Toto was able to get both of them out. Being lightly scorched is nothing new to Maki. So she's probably fine because she has the ability to heal her body, you know, and probably less fine, but that's apparently good enough for Yuji, who decides to steal his resolve because his brother is there and he can trick himself into believing that the other sorcerers are probably all right. And thus, in this moment, he has to believe in Toto. However, believing in Toto might not be the smartest thing, because in the final panel of the chapter, Yuji and Toto are heading towards Tsukuna to possibly give him a Mahito or Hanabi style beatdown. And in this panel, Yuji is clashing his fists together, and Toto is doing something rather interesting. And that's something rather interesting is removing his bandage. Why is he doing that, you ask, Nick? Probably because he needs to use Boogie Woogie. But Nick, didn't we just assume that he used Boogie Woogie to get Eno and Maki out of Sukuna's domain? Well, that's what the story is trying to hint at us. If he's just now removing his bandage, that means he probably didn't use Boogie Woogie to get Maki or Eno out of the domain, which means that there's a fair to good chance that both of them shared a fate with Chozo. Here's the thing. The last time we were told that somebody might be all right, that was Nobara, and we haven't seen her in almost 200 chapters. So listen, is there the possibility that Maki and Eno were able to escape Sukuna's domain by themselves? themselves? Maybe. I'd say there's a higher chance for Maki than there is for Eno. And is there the possibility that Toto was able to use his boogie woogie with his bandage on to get Maki and Eno out of the domain? Also, maybe. But if he can use boogie woogie with his bandage on, why is he removing it now? Kind of makes you think that he can't use boogie woogie with the bandage on. But who knows? Maybe he can only use boogie woogie at its fullest potential with the bandage off. Which kind of raises the question, why wouldn't the bandage be off when he's outside of the domain trying to use boogie woogie the furthest he's ever used it, reaching into Sukuna's domain to save people from an immediate death? I got a lot of questions and most of them unfortunately lead to the answer that Maki and Eno may not be breathing. But don't worry, the narrator reveals in the last panel that Sukuna's now in a state where it's difficult for him to use curse techniques after a domain expansion. But he'll be fine because he'll just make a binding vow that says he can now only pee on days that end in day because he made this incredibly difficult and uphill battle of a binding vow he can now use his curse techniques at full power immediately after using his domain expansion. Because that's, that's just how it works. Or are you in a tough situation? Binding vow your way out of it for the low, low cost of nothing. Hey, okay, okay, we don't know how the fire arrow works. Simply rewrite the rules. Like usually the innate technique of applied to Sukuna's domain expansion is dismantled. However, after a certain amount of times of using cleave and dismantle in one day, Sukuna unlocks Kamino, at which point he's able to make Kamino the innate technique applied to his domain. Boom, bing, bam, there it is. Is it still an ass pull? Yeah, but it doesn't use a plot device that has now been so watered down it basically means nothing except for Sukuna gets out of jail free card. Miwa made a binding vow that said she could never pick up a katana again and Kenjaku snagged the blade. Sukuna says, oh, my domain expansion is only going to be open for 90 seconds and it can't target Maki. And he at his weakest point ever just gets a full power domain expansion. And then he's like, oh, I'm going to put barriers on my domain expansion that doesn't usually have barriers. And thus I'm going to shrink the effective range of my domain expansion and he gets to just nuke an entire domain with fire that kills special grade cursed spirits. It's stupid. It's, it's, it's bad. It's bad writing. Here's the thing. We all knew Chozo was going to die eventually. That's fine. I mean, it's not fine. I'm not happy about it. I loved him as a character, but like even the return of Toto is, is dumb. It's not well written. There was nothing to hint at Toto's return. He's just getting tossed back into the story with two panels of flashback to try and explain why he's there. We haven't seen or heard from him since the Shibuya incident. He hasn't been a part of the Kusakabe coalition. Oh, it's because he didn't want Yuji to know he was coming back. That's dumb. Dumb. 
That's dumb. That's just you giving into pressure because you writ yourself into a corner of killing off everybody that could possibly help Yuji in this final battle against Sukuna. And yes, I get that it's a cyclical nature of Toto being there in all of Yuji's most down and out moments to help him battle back through the toughest enemies he's ever faced. It's what happened against Hanami, it's what happened against Mahito, and it's now what's happening against Sukuna. So I get that that is cool, but there's a way to set that up. There's a way to foreshadow these kinds of things. You're telling me we can get foreshadowing for Yuji being Sukuna his long lost twin like a hundred chapters in advance but we can't get the smallest bit of foreshadowing for toto coming back because we didn't want yuji to know based off a line of logic that doesn't track at all at least not yet i don't know man it's a good chapter a lot of cool stuff happened i'm just i'm just sick of the way it's being written because here's the thing it's it's just the continuation of the sukuna cycle because here's the thing we, we don't have to be doing what we're doing right now. If Yuji had awoken by being blessed by the Black Sparks and had won in the battle against Sukuna in five or so chapters, nobody would have complained. We had momentum, but even now that we're heading into what could be one of the hyper moments in all of JJK, I feel as though the momentum in the manga has been completely halted. Like I'm excited about next week's chapter. I'm just, I don't know, not as excited as I was about it when Yuji was hitting a bunch of black flashes because the story was focused around Yuji at that time. But no break next week. So in seven days, we'll get to see the Boogie Woogie breakdown. And I'm excited for it. I'm just, I'm just salty about Chozo, I guess. He deserved better than some stupid binding vow death. It's like off screening Gojo. It's just, it's just dumb. Whatever. Leave me alone. Go away. Like the video, subscribe to the channel and hit the noti bell. Gonna go break down chapter 422 of MHA. Hope. Hope that's better.